Welcome everyone to our Women in Leadership Fireside Chat Series hosted by Rise Leadership. I am really excited and honored to be here today to speak with Lisa Nelson, President of International at Equifax. She runs over a million dollar business, so impressive, and you know, we can learn so much from her. Lisa is a legend. And so I'm really excited to be able to hear from her, you know, what was her career strategy to get to the top, to become president at a, mil at a multi-billion dollar company. And, you know, she confessed to me earlier that she struggles with self-doubt and she's here to share her stories with us. So excited to hear about, you know, how does she, like, when does self-doubt pop up for her and how does she navigate that? And then, of course, she has spent, been in many, many rooms where she's the only woman in the room. We can definitely all relate. It's a difficult situation to navigate. And so I'm really curious to hear how Lisa has navigated that and totally owned it and crushed it and gotten to the top now. I am Shivani Berry. I am the CEO and founder of Arise Leadership. We offer online leadership programs to help women move into management. And I really think we need to have more open and honest conversations to help drive this change. Our mission is to elevate 1 million women into leadership. And Lisa has a similar, you know, I know Lisa cares deeply about empowering women. So that's a big reason why I was so excited to have her here. And then she has all this wealth and wisdom that we can like take into and learn from. So Lisa, thank you so much for joining us. I am honored to have you here today. Thanks, Shivani. And let me just say, I'm honored and excited to be here as well. Uh, for those that wouldn't know, I met Shivani, I don't know, Shivani, a few months ago. And what struck me uh, with Shivani and the mission of Arise, as it relates to so many other great organizations out there, is your focus on early career development. And um, maybe to help you understand why that I'm so passionate about that component of it, let me just tell you a quick little bit about myself. So as you mentioned, I lead a $1.2 billion business unit inside of Equifax. For people that don't know what Equifax is, we're a global company focused on data analytics and technology that drive solutions for our customers that help them make better decisions our purpose is helping people live their financial best. And it's a purpose that really sits at the core, I know, of what I do. And so um, in addition to my role as leading the International Business Unit, I'm also our executive co-sponsor of our Global Women's Network, which has enabled me or given me this great opportunity to tap into where women are at across our entire organization on top of talking to great organizations like yours. And so perhaps maybe I'll start with me and how I came to be in this role, but really it starts with how I was raised and it's what connects me to the mission of Arise because I grew up in a family. A mom was a terrific, amazing school teacher. She's in her 80s, retired and still hears from her students. I had a father who was an engineer, worked at Toro Company his entire life. But the two of them had the most amazing partnership. And I was raised as the oldest of three kids, girl, boy, girl. But we were raised believing we can do anything. We were raised that it didn't matter that I was a girl and my brother Tom was a boy. We all could do anything we wanted to do. And so that foundation of belief in us, uh, along with the role modeling that we saw in our parents, where they truly were partners, was just my way of living. And what's helped me, especially in the last decade where I've done so much global traveling, is it's helped me appreciate how, what a gift that was. And that a lot of people haven't been given that gift, especially a lot of us women have not been given that gift. And so understanding at your core where your belief system lies is so important. And, and that's, that's kind of the foundation of who I became, became and where I'm at right now. And so when I think about um, my journey, first off, I would say, you know, people ask, well, what was your strategy to get this, to get to this level? And I say, it wasn't my objective. My objective really early on was to make a material difference in wherever I was working. And in making a material difference in the early stages of my career was 
just give me some impact on our strategy. I can do so much more than be a salesperson. I started out being a salesperson and I went from there into marketing and management and you know other great learning opportunities, but it wasn't so that I could be a CEO or the president of an international big business unit. It was because I wanna make a difference. So my driving force has always been, I want to make a difference. And where that really has helped me in my career um, progression has been that I don't view my colleague next door as my competition. Our competition is out there. You know, we're here to win and to make a difference. <laughs> and if we're all making a difference, it's a lot of fun. And so I would say that understanding our self-beliefs and then really being passionate about making a difference and winning together has got to be at the cornerstones of how we begin to flourish in our careers. And um, in doing that, I spent 18 years at one company and I had opportunities, um, not always up, often sideways. In fact, one story was um, a gentleman that I consider one of my very, very first mentors, Andy Hallock. I know he's out there. I haven't talked to Andy for forever, but he, I had been a salesperson. I had run alliance marketing programs. I had done some really great strategic work. And he talked about, I need people management skills. And I said, that's fine, but just don't put me in a call center. And he looked at me. I said, you're putting me in a call center. And for those of you that work in call centers, I mean, there that might sound disrespectful. I have zero disrespect after working in a call center. There is something beautiful about being there with the customers, hearing what they're telling us, understanding where their concerns are or where they need help, knowing that every day you go in, you pretty much take care of that customer and you end the day feeling like, wow, I got a lot done today, right? Because it's all in the moment. And what that did for me was it gave me this appreciation of operations of the what often is described as back office. But what I say is the heart and soul of so many companies taking great care of our customers enables us to acquire more customers, keep those that we have and get more. So those kinds of experiences um, that I thought, oh, I don't want to do this ended up being some of my richest experiences as I came back to do other work and continue on in my career. So um, those first 18 years was a lot of bebopping back and forth, sort of moving up and ultimately owning a PL. And then from there, things just took off. But um, I would say being open to those enriching experiences and not being fixated on that next step in the ladder is, is so, so critical. And then eventually the time came where I made a big, bold move to leave that organization and move to another where I stayed for almost another 10, so 18 years and 10 years, right? And now over another 10 years. So I am not a, I, I'm probably an anomaly to many of you listening or watching because so often we do move companies to get to the next opportunity. Um, for me, I was so fortunate to have these opportunities come from within. And um, it's really how I built out kind of a, a, a subject matter, well, not, not so much a subject matter expertise, but a really keen understanding of how these organizations worked, how to influence. So influence management is as important as direct line management in my job that I have today, if I weren't able to influence the organization as well as, you know, ha having my line accountability, I wouldn't be as good at what I do as I'm doing right now. So those kinds of skills you learn as you work with your way through an organization. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. There's so many like just nuggets that we can pick up and remember from that. And I think one of the things I in particular really appreciated and was very refreshing to hear about how you weren't just focused on just getting to the top. It was focusing on getting the right experiences. And like you called out with the call center experience, sometimes you don't even know. And I can definitely relate to that in my career. Like some of the things I didn't even expect certain moments to be career changing moments, but 
and I think it really goes to show like your philosophy about just your career is very zigzaggy and that actually serves you very well but often the stereotype is like oh I need to take I always need to focus on the upward projection and I know I've definitely spent many much time just stalking LinkedIn profiles of leaders that I admire and be like okay how do they do it and just you know from outside it looks so linear like okay they were here then they did this and then they did this but then in reality, it's so helpful to see the insides of your experience and it actually isn't so linear and there's mistakes and failures and also like just adjacent paths along the way that land you up there. So I, I super appreciate you sharing that. Thank you for that. You, bet. And, you know, I, I think it's so important how you called out right now that influence is such an important part of your job. And that was actually a big reason why I decided to start Arise because I realized that also my role, but I'm like, we never get taught this. We never get taught how to get buy-in. We never get taught how do you like get people on board, went over to people's stakeholders. So I'd love to just hear from your experience, what's your strategy to go do this? Like, what is like, let's say you're trying to win over a difficult stakeholder on a project. You know, what is your advice for us? Like one to two things that we should be thinking about to do to better work with them and get them over to our side. I'd say I have two, two prongs to that answer. The first is never try to convince someone in a large group setting. It just, you might as well talk to a wall, right? And so at taking the time, not just to share your perspective, but to then stop and hear who it is that you're trying to convince, where are they coming from? Why is it that you're not on the same page? Because I will say, as often as I'm successful in convincing someone else, that person has successfully convinced me to make a tweak. And often it's a tweak that, that creates that alignment. So convincing often requires listening more than talking. And I have been in countless huge negotiations, um, you know, selling solutions, aligning a new strategic partner. And again, you got to listen. And I mean, listen, right? Be empathetic in your listening. Understand where is it that they're coming from? Not because you necessarily agree, but once you understand where somebody's coming from, it opens the door for you to have a different approach to sharing your perspective or working on that convincing. The second approach that I would um, share, and I, uh, you know, I employ this even today, is who are your allies? Who are on the same page with you? And sometimes a second or a third voice working that same person can share their perspectives in a manner that might resonate in a different way and can help you get to the, to the alignment that you're looking for. But by and large, influence, it, it requires listening more than anything else. Yeah, definitely. And, and I love the fact about like, I'm also a big fan of the pre-meetings, doing the one-on-one before getting to large meeting, because I agree, like, I always, I'm like, I should know the outcome of this before I, we actually get into that meeting. It's the way yeah. I 100% I agree on that. And yeah. you know how you're saying around like empathetic listening, what are some of the questions that you use or phrases that you use to get that information to understand where people are coming from and to navigate that conversation? Sure. I, I work with a couple of people that, um, you know, there, there's this common phrase these days about what is your superpower. Then um, I wouldn't say this egotistically, but I've been told this a lot, which is my superpower is leveraging my authenticity to really connect with people to get done what we need to get done. And so when you think about a strategy, part of, part of connecting with us, with anyone uh, for any reason, whether you're influencing or, you know, creating alignment or whatever that, whatever the end goal is, allowing yourself to be vulnerable enough and authentic enough so that they see who you really are and that you're driven by a common goal or a common goodness or a desire to win together makes all the difference in the world. And so, you know, really being authentic as you're searching for a way to connect in with people has an amazing impact, both in terms of the outcome, but also speed to outcome, because often 
We don't have days or weeks or months to get on the same page. We've got to figure out why aren't we on the same page? Let's talk about it. So if you violently disagree with me, Shambhani, why? What is your baseline assumption that is so different from mine that we can't get to the same page, right? And I think, again, understanding where a person's coming from helps me anyway, really figure out how can I map to where they're at and get us to this, you know, to a place where we can, we can be aligned. Yeah, for, for sure. I, I really love that. I think that's really important. Just like flushing out, be like, what is your issue with this? Let's just like dive straight into it. Let's just cut right into it. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, like when that comes to mind, courageous, courageous conversation is another phrase. Yeah. I that, love that. You know, Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ooh, that's really good. Yeah. I love that. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, these courageous conversations become a lot easier when you're in person because there's body language and, you know, personal rapport and harder when you're on Zoom or another virtual conversation. So are there certain things that you found helpful when you're in a virtual conversation or a phone call to help break the ice and navigate that tension? I, again, I'm going to go back to authenticity. You know, you have to be a person who is approachable, who's listening, and who, who, who that person can trust. And it's interesting, I would agree, you can establish that rapport a whole lot faster in person, in a room, hands down. But I also believe if I lean in and I'm looking at you in the eyes on my screen and I'm letting you see me, I'm letting you see my emotions, my reactions, my enthusiasm, we can do this on Zoom, perhaps not as well as in person, but we can we can do a lot when we have the ability to at least see the facial features. So I know for me in our team meetings, and maybe some of you are experiencing the same with, with this hybrid situation that so many of us have, you got a lot of people in the room, you've got a handful of those that are virtual, often there's a camera and the rest of us look like ants. So our protocol is, laptops up everyone so while if you're virtual you can see the whole room you can also see my face right and the face of everyone sitting in that room so that you have the opportunity to see what's really going on you know as we're having the conversation wow i love that that's such a practical easy tip to implement but i don't i don't think people really do that it's so easy just pull up your laptop and get on there to level the playing field yeah, that person. That's really great. I really love that. I'd love to shift gears a bit and talk about self-doubt. Because I mean, honestly, talking to you all the time, like it feels like you have it all together and you've been kind enough to be and vulnerable enough to share with us that you don't always feel like that. And in that really, you know, right now when you're saying your superpower is authenticity, I was like, in my mind, I was like nodding my head. Yes. Yeah. So it's like, that's really what drew me to you. And that's why I was like, I really want to host her here because I just think you're such an inspiration. And so thank you for that and for calling that out. Because I think often we feel like, oh, you know, especially as a woman, an executive, you feel we feel like you have to together and you can't show any kind of vulnerability, but you are such a good example of that's actually not true. And so I would love to dig into more about like, when have you felt self-doubt? Like, what are the kind of self-limiting beliefs that you've had to struggle with in your leadership journey? Yeah, I I think that's a great and a very fair question. Uh, You said at the very beginning of the session, I struggle with self-doubt. I would disagree with that. I don't feel like I struggle with it, but I acknowledge it, right? I acknowledge it and I deal with it. In fact, I was at an industry conference just earlier this week in New York, and we had a conversation about, um, we were actually talking about mental health in the workplace and how important mental health is in the workplace and how that then feeds into um, performance. And our guest speaker had a lot of work with elite athletes where basically their competitive edge often is their mental health and their ability to believe, right? And so um, we were talking about if I've won two gold medals and I'm out for my third gold medal, am I nervous? Yeah. Do I have a little self-doubt? Yeah right? So I'll take myself as an example. I have had really great success in a lot of different roles. I moved into this international business unit role, uh, where instead of running a business, 
I essentially lead a portfolio of really great business leaders. That's a whole new role for me, right? It's, I am now really influencing. I'm not going to tell a regional president who runs a $400 million business what to do. How unempowering is that? But what I need to do is make sure I'm there drawing out the best in them, you know, being a great sounding board, being a great coach. So it was a new, not a new skill, but a different, different day-to-day -day work life. And of course, you start to wonder, can I do this? You know, this is, this is more like a CEO role than a business unit leader role. And so, yeah, there's a little self-doubt. Or likewise, I am now sitting at a table of our leadership team table where the last 10 years, I've worked for that leadership team. They've talked about me twice a year when it comes to performance reviews, right? And so now I'm, I'm one of them. And so um, it, it isn't, I would say that maybe there's a little self-doubt. What I also recognize is that at times there's a little, some self-limiting beliefs. Do they really perceive me that way or am I projecting they're perceiving me that way, right? And so uh, one of the great discussions we had this week is self-talk. And, and once you realize you have a self-doubt or you're experiencing some self-limiting beliefs, you got to talk to yourself, right? Maybe talk to others, maybe a coach, maybe a trusted colleague, but more importantly, understand where is your head? What are you saying to yourself? Am I enough? Yes, I'm enough. I know I can do this. Or am I enough? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I'm just going to sit back and not really put myself out there because ooh, I, I'm not sure. And so for me, as soon as I start to feel or recognize a self-doubt, a self-limiting belief, I got to own it, right? I got to own it, figure out where is that coming from, and then figure out how to overcome it. And it's all about what I'm saying to myself in my head. And so I think all of us deal with that. And interestingly, I sat at a table, we were very, very evenly mixed gender-wise in this uh, session or this industry conference that I was at, but I said, there was a couple of guys sitting with us in this small group conversation. And I said, um, is, uh, oh, the, the phrase was imposter syndrome. Do you think men deal with imposter syndrome? And both the guys go, oh yeah, oh yeah. We don't, we never use that phrase, but we have those feelings, right? And, I, and so from a gender perspective, perhaps it's easier I'm not saying this in, in, you know, it's a hundred percent, but maybe men have just been, have grown up and have taught themselves stronger self-talk than what some of us as women have done. So, you know, to, for anyone to say, I have no doubts ever in my career, man or woman, come on, are you really telling the truth? So it's really more about what do you do about it and how do you overcome it and how do you kind of rise above it? And so that's what I would encourage everyone to do, no matter where you're at in your career, you know, one or two years in or 35 years in, we're all going to deal with aspects of it. So figure out how do you take charge of what you're saying to yourself? I love that. I love that piece about the self-talk. I think it's so important and we control that narrative. And you're right. When I, whenever I hear someone saying like, oh, I don't have any doubt. I'm like, when I think you're lying to us or maybe two, you're just not pushing yourself enough. It's like that's, that's too easy. Go get a new role. In your yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think part of a lot of the, you know, limiting beliefs ties into us advocating for ourselves like that, you know, and so I'd love to, you, you have so much experience in this. And I think so often we hear from our listeners, from our risers around like, you know, how do I advocate for myself, especially in these really uncertain times in the midst of budget cuts, reorg, just tension and stress within high, a lot of pressure within the organization. So what advice do you have for our listeners and what are some specific strategies that they can apply to help advocate for themselves or what's worked for you? I would say first, know your value. If you don't know your value, you're gonna have a hard time for others acknowledging your value. And when I say know your value as a whole, right? Holistically know your value. 
But I take it a step further and say, can you quantify your value? Can you quantify um, the impact you're having within your team, on your organization, on your p and I'll give you a great example. There's a woman who works with us in Europe running operations. And she had the opportunity to be promoted from within. So again, how do you prove yourself, right? She proved herself, is proving herself, continues to do so on steroids. Because not only was she finding low-hanging fruit to drive improved productivity or cost takeout opportunities for reinvestment, but she quantifies every step she's taking. And it's awesome because once you start to quantify your value, you're in a whole different ball game when it comes to establishing credibility, getting peers to engage. It's influence management. Hey, do you know when we changed this process from A to B, we were able to take out this much cost and redirect and drive this much greater productivity in this whole different area? And people are like, wow, what more can we do? You know, you get people leaning into you. So I would say, know your own value, quantify it as best as you can. Different roles have different ways of doing that, but HR, you can quantify your value. Yeah. Finance, you certainly can and quantify, you know, your contributions to it. So sales, easy, right? You, you know what your numbers are. Um, it's hard to find a function that doesn't have some quantifiable aspect to it. And then I would say the other thing is know yourself. You know, if you want to advocate for yourself, first of all, know the value you're delivering today. And then what are your aspirations? How could you raise your hand to say, you know what, at some point in the next three to five years, I would love to be doing this. I see this as an opportunity for me to contribute and give you value to the, give value to the company while well, I'm going to gain all kinds of experience. So know yourself, where is it that you're wanting to move or do next or, you know, drive your own development and then raise your hand. Our CEO at Equifax, he's got a great line, be the CEO of yourself. You know, be the CEO of yourself and understand where are you today? Where do you want to go tomorrow? Yeah, I think that's so important. You have to take control of your own career around it. You can't just rely on others. And and so, you know, around that, I this is that knowing your value. I love to call out like quantify it ar around it. What especially, you know, let's say someone's coming to you in more like, kind of early, like mid-level earlier stage. Um, because we're right now, you know, I loved how you called out the broken rung earlier on like and uh, how we've been that's been a really um great conversation me and you have been having back and forth around that. And so I'd love to like, you know, maybe pick your brain around how, you know, that broken run, getting more women into leadership, what's one thing that you think they should be doing in addition to what you just shared around knowing your value, quantifying, any, even if it's something minor that maybe we don't even always think about to help them stand out in their roles? Yeah, um, I, I'm learning a lot from you, Shivani, when it comes to the broken rung and, you know, women earlier in their career. And like I said, uh, especially because I'm in 24 countries. And I see cultural variation, I see gender variation, I see there's so much variation. But for those who haven't been raised with role models that help them see how important it is to have a voice, not to dominate a conversation, but to listen and contribute and influence, all of us have an opportunity to do that, even first year you know, uh, analysts that are in an organization or whatever your first year role might be. I'll never forget my, I started out as a sales rep and I did fine as a sales rep, but my mentor who stayed with me for several years, the gentleman I just called out earlier, he said, you know, we'd like to hear more from you. Like, what are you hearing or seeing? And I'm like, oh, you want to know that? And I organized my thoughts and I put it in a document and it truly was probably one of my first actions that gave me a whole nother trajectory of opportunity. But I knew so much 
I didn't know that people would value that. I was 20, whatever, three-year-old, 24-year-old, brand new salesperson, but I did know a lot. And so I just shared in a constructive manner what I was hearing from our customers, what I was observing about our solutions. And it was fantastic. So I would say that, you know, all of us have a way to influence, whether it's, a, you know, an initiative like that, whether it's sitting in a, a staff meeting, um, you know, sharing some of your thoughts and perspectives based on where you sit. When I meet employees anywhere in any region, I do a lot of town halls. I meet people from all walks of life in Equifax International. Often I'll have lunches that are mixed, you know, people are meeting each other for the first time because they're different functions or different levels. And um, I, I'll say I have no agenda other than to connect with you and to have a dialogue so we can go wherever you want to go. But I will tell you, if there are things you know that you think I don't and I should, that's my favorite topic, right? And so giving someone the freedom or the license to say, here's what I see and here's what I think is fantastic. We can do that for each other. We can also try to be proactive and offer that up on our own. I love that. I think that, and to your point, like we all have it within our grasp, especially, you know, a question I often get is like, how do I connect with senior leaders who are so busy? And it's always like, you actually have a lot of information that they care about. And you know how you're like, I packaged it up in a really constructive way. That's really important, but then sharing that out. And I, yeah. I, and I especially admire that you already now in your role, in your like leadership role, you ask your group, like, what do I do? What do I not know? And so you already create that opening. Uh, you sound like an incredible leader. And so like whoever gets to work with you, under you, is like, I'm, they're very lucky. So I'm sure they're already well, so much. Some might feel that way. Some might be <laughs> seeing or listening to this podcast later and think, mm. no, I'm just teasing. No, no, I, no, I mean, I have a no, good I think, with our we, team. I mean, we've already learned so much from you and it's only been 30 <laughs> minutes, which I really, really appreciate. Yeah. Yeah. So I have, uh, you know, I'd love to dive into more, talk more about failures because I find that we often sell out, celebrate our successes, especially on social media these days, but we don't talk so much about failures, but actually, you know, knowing how to overcome your failure is what actually gets you to be successful. And we've all had failures. So what's a failure that you've had in your career and what have you learned from it? Yeah, I, I don't, I, I had a feeling this question would be coming. It comes off in, and I don't have like this crushing, oh my God, this happened to me kind of failure. I would say my thematic failure is I just, I just get going and I make things happen. And sometimes I forget to pause and look up and explain to my peers, even worse yet, to the person I work for, here's what's going on. I got it all covered. You know, it kind of goes back to your question about advocacy. Am I advocating for me and my team enough? I that is a to-do. Like I put it in my, it's in my weekly planner. It's in my calendar. I have to remind myself. In fact, I just had a conversation today about an acquisition and a lot of great integration pre-planning work that we're already doing. And a couple of my peers expressed concern, like, are we doing enough? I said, oh, we are all over this. I, I need to bring you in, right? And so for me, um, it's a thematic failure <laughs> in that I just, I am so into making things happen that I forget to take a step back and um, be an advocate for the great work that the team has got going on. So that probably is my ongoing self-development challenge, I'll call it. Um, beyond that, I think I, my, um, I've only really worked for three companies in my entire career. My second company was one that um, really became, rudder, well, I'll say FICO, because anybody that looks on, a, on LinkedIn will see that. FICO went through a really challenging time. And, um, and it was during a time, I, I, I was volunteering. I said, can I run strategy? Can I do this? Can I do that? And it, it, it didn't go anywhere. And it eventually led to me making a decision to move over to Equifax. And then within a few months, there was a new CEO. There was all kinds of new energy. And FICO has been this fabulous, fabulous success story. Um, ever since. And so um, I do sort of look back on myself in, in that, you know, in that era thinking, was there more I 
Um, I had, I felt like I had gotten into such a dysfunctional, you know, culture that I, I couldn't rise above it and really influence it. Um, and so that's one that I continue to draw from, you know, from learning lessons and, and just how do I make sure I don't go to that place again, where I just give up? How do I always find ways to go up and around and through and, you know, how do I make things better? So I would, I would call out those two examples. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. I can definitely relate. I also get so caught in the like heads down that mm -hmm. I forget to share. And often people assume the worst in the absence of information. And I'm like, no, 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 wait, we're actually have this all covered. Like, like you shared. So I appreciate that. So, you know, as last question to wrap up, what's a piece of career advice that you would have for us? career advice. Um, I think probably there are times where I stayed too long because I was so passionate about the people I worked with, the, you know, the, the work that was going on, that it, I, I probably had I done a better job of more frequently doing a self-assessment, uh, you know, I, I may have made some different decisions along the way. So I would say one, make sure you're being thoughtful of where you're at and where you're going and be the CEO of yourself. Two, I would say, find something that wherever, whatever you're doing, you're not only, well, let me say it a different way. And it, this comes from a, a, a colleague of mine who I work with today, who's an author, um, you know, what, what is your success? What is winning for you? Because winning for everyone isn't getting to the top job. You know, winning might be finding a role where you know you're making a big impact, you're making a strategic difference, and you're having fun doing it. You're finding joy. You know, you're, you're in a role that requires a bit of international travel, and you love that aspect of your role. You're in a role that doesn't require travel and you're in a phase in your life where you've got young children at home and you want to be home every night. You know, what, what is it that, that makes you feel balanced and have joy while you're working hard and doing great things with your career? I would say my advice is always strive for that balance. Make sure that you're where you are because you want to be there and that it's bringing good things to your life. I really love that. Lisa, this has been really insightful and amazing. And it's really just been an honor just getting to talk to you and hearing about your experience. And I thank you so much for your time, for sharing your wealth of experience and just being really real with us and candid. I super, super appreciate it. Thank you to everyone for joining. It's, you know, I'm, I'm sure we have so many takeaways and notes and I'm like mentally taking so many notes in my brain just with everything Lisa shared. And we will share the recording of this. So you can always go back and rewatch it. Lisa, thank you again. I truly appreciate it. And you're just such an inspiration and a legend. And I'm so grateful that we got to have this conversation. And I just want to say you're an inspiration to so many too, Shivani, including me. We're all learning every day. That means day. a lot coming you, from you. You're, you're teaching me as much as I'm sharing with you. So great work with all that you're doing at Arise. I super appreciate that. It means a lot coming from you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye, all.